One thing that I've been really interested in is the Younger Dryas theory and the impact hypothesis. I've gone to the sites. I've gone all through the Scablands with Randall Carlson. I'm a big fan of Graham Hancock. And I would love to get your take on the Younger Dryas event and the possibility of a civilization existing into the Ice Age. Is there any possibility of that? Yeah, I'm, I'm open to it. And I find some of that evidence quite compelling. I will tell you, um, I've spent a great deal of time in the Scablands, and I am intimately familiar with the historical development of the so-called Brett's Flood hypothesis. In fact, I used to teach it, so just for the sake of your listeners not being confused, Brett's is B-R-E-T-Z. He was a geologist who recognized that the extraordinary structures in the Scablands of eastern Washington were completely inconsistent with the explanation that was used uh, to describe how they were formed. In essence, in the post-Lyle period, geologists had fallen in love with the idea that any sudden explanation was effectively biblical and that these structures were all produced through very gradual processes over very long periods of time. And indeed, that is how things like the Grand Canyon have been formed. But the Scablands of eastern Washington had features that Bretts realized simply couldn't be accounted for in this way. And what he concluded was that there was an utterly profound and sudden flood that had come through eastern Washington. And when he deployed this hypothesis for the first time in, I think, 1922, he was ridiculed across the field, and he spent decades fighting to make the point that actually the evidence simply pointed to a massive flood. And um, we now know that that's correct and that it was not even just one flood, but it was a repeated pattern of flooding, and we know why the floods happened, which I can tell you in a second. But the point is he went from a pariah in geology, ridiculed as a fringe lunatic, to winning geology's highest prize between the period of 1922 and then 1978 is when he was awarded the prize. In fact, when he was asked about it, he said that everybody he felt like calling up to gloat was already dead. Um, but the, uh, the point of the story, to me, there are many. One, you can't tell just because somebody is being ridiculed by an entire field for having apparently not understood the evidence. That doesn't tell you whether they're right or wrong. And in fact, you should be very interested if this is an intelligent person who is unpersuaded by the supposed evidence that says they're wrong, you should hear them out and you should figure out, you know, in the case of the Scablands, I used to enjoy taking students there because nobody knew this story. You could rely on the fact that students were not aware at, at what the Scablands were and uh, what had created them. So I could actually lead students into the Scablands, and I could just show them the evidence that Bretz was proceeding from, and I could show them why it was a paradox. You know, I could stand on a giant uh, granite boulder in the middle of uh, an open prairie, and I could stand on it, and I could say, this is a glacial erratic. Glacial erratics are transported by slow-moving glaciers, which carve out rock from mountains and push it ahead of them. And then when the glaciers recede, the rocks are left in places that they are geologically foreign. And the students would say, oh, that's fascinating. And I would say, the problem is there were never any glaciers here, and yet I'm standing on a glacial erratic. How can that be? Right? I could do that, and then I could show them the pattern of the carving out of the valleys, the fact that the shape of the valleys um, was inconsistent with gradual erosion or glaciers. I could show them the world's largest waterfall, now completely dry. And the question is, well, how could this waterfall possibly be here? What might have fed it? So that ability to show students these structures, to show them the paradox, and then to reveal over the space of a day what actually had produced the Scablands, and then to describe the story of uh, J. Harlan Bretz and the battles that he went through, to tell the story of J.T. Pardee 
the geologist who, when Bretz had revealed his hypothesis and had immediately drawn the ridicule of his colleagues, Pardee, who had been a geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, who was very smart but didn't have Bretz's courage, he leaned over to the guy next to him and he said, I know where the water came from. He knew in 1922 the explanation that Bretz couldn't put his finger on. Where was the water coming from that made this gigantic flood? So anyway, my point is one thing we don't do a good job of in science is providing a history in which people realize that the things that we come to understand as obvious from the evidence may originally have faced ridicule. And therefore, the sound of ridicule shouldn't tell you anything. Um, so I, uh, that's about as far as I can go with respect to the Younger Dryas event and the particular hypothesis of advanced civilizations having uh, preexisted. But I'm open to it precisely because I know that the fact that many people think it's laughable, uh, if anything, that just makes it interesting. Wow, I am blown away by how much you know about it. I've been looking into this stuff for a while, and you just said it all. And yeah, I'm curious where where did you where do you suspect that water came from on those floods? The water came from a ice dam that blocked the Clark Fork River, and so the basic pattern is you have a glaciation these fingers of ice spread down from the poles. They actually don't get all that far. The Canadian-U.S. border is kind of where those glaciers stop for the most part. You know, the, our sense that there are glaciers much farther south, is be, those are alpine glaciers. So Yosemite was indeed formed by glaciers during the Ice Age, but those were descending from high mountains rather than from the poles. In any case, these glacial fingers reach down from the poles, a particular glacial finger because of the idiosyncrasies of the land and the pattern of uh, temperature that's based on the circulation of the atmosphere results in this finger blocking the Clark Fork River. When the Clark Fork River gets blocked, water builds up behind it, creating what we now call Glacial Lake Missoula, which would have been an incredibly deep lake. I think it was... 1,500 feet deep, something like that. It was an incredibly large amount of water, the size of two modern-day Great Lakes. And that would have sat behind this dam. And then what happens is a process, when you have that amount of water, it creates a tremendous amount of pressure at the bottom. That pressure, because water increases in volume when it freezes, that pressure prevents water from freezing, and so it is able to be supercooled. It can be below the freezing temperature of water, and it cannot solidify because that pressure is keeping it from doing so. And so what we now understand is that that, that supercooled water actually trickled through cracks in the dam and opened weaknesses, and the dam exploded, letting loose this entire gigantic lake which then rushed at a speed of something like 60 miles an hour across the landscape, scouring it and destroying it, literally grinding up the stuff that was on the surface moments before and created this you know, largest waterfall that had ever flowed on the face of the earth and then careened down the rest of the Scablands and into the what is now the Columbia River Gorge. The Columbia River Gorge was actually created by the same flood, and all of that water flowed out towards the Pacific. It washed into the Willamette Valley. In part, the Willamette Valley in Oregon is fertile. It's great farmland, in part because the materials that were in eastern Washington got washed into it, and then it washed out into the Pacific. Um, so, and, and the point is, because the triggering event of this is the growth of the ice dam that blocks the Clark Fork River, and because that ice sheet, that finger of ice, grows in the same place because the conditions that created it the first time remained there even after the lake had emptied out, this happened repeatedly. The finger of ice blocked the river, the lake builds up, the supercooled water creates the fissures in the dam, and the dam explodes, and it happens once again. And so the Scablands are really the, the outwash of this glacial 
process that we just simply can't directly observe. Now, interestingly, because the last ice age took place so recently, I don't think we know for sure, but it is quite possible that there were humans who actually observed this event. This was not in the distant past. We're talking about 15,000 years ago. And when you think about the kinds of stories that get handed down, these colossal floods, one possibility is that actually colossal floods are something that has been observed and has made quite an impression and has been inscribed into myths precisely because it was so significant that uh, people were utterly compelled to report what they had seen and it got handed down one generation after another. Do you think that this Scablands flood was an isolated event or perhaps it was part of like a global, something happened to the globe at that period that triggered massive change globally? Well, you know, let's put it this way, what you've just suggested is definitely true. The, uh, the way that Milankovitch oscillations create ice ages and interglacial periods. That is what, what are M Milan Milankovitch. Um, the Milankovitch cycles are oscillations in the Earth's orbit that very slightly adjust the amount of the sun's energy that is trapped here. There are three major Milankovitch cycles. They involve the angle of tilt of the Earth, which is not stable at the moment. It's 23 and a half degrees, but there is a, an oscillation in the degree of tilt. There is an oscillation in the degree of obliquity of the orbit of the Earth, how round versus oval the orbit is. And then there is a, an oscillation of the precession of the axis of rotation of the Earth. So the North Star is not always where the North Pole points. And these things are on very different time scales. We have a 100,000-year time scale, a roughly 41,000-year time scale, and a roughly 20,000-year time scale. So these are out of phase. But when they all happen together in such a way that causes slightly cooler northern summers. That is to say, the northern hemisphere has a summer that is slightly cooler than normal because these oscillations have all reduced the amount of solar energy. That causes ice to remain that would have melted otherwise. So in other words, the glacial tops of mountains, the degree of the poles is slightly preserved beyond average and when that happens, because ice is white and reflects energy back into space, the next summer tends to be even a little bit cooler because now you've got some of the energy that would have been absorbed by the dark ocean, for example, bounce back into space, which causes uh, the next summer to be slightly cooler, which causes slightly more ice to remain, which causes more energy to be bounced back into space, which causes the next summer to be slightly cooler, etc. And so here you get the glaciers descending down from the poles, and this continues until there is enough out-of-phaseness of the Milankovitch cycles for the process to reverse, where you get an abnormally slightly warm summer, and that causes slightly more ice to melt, which causes slightly more energy to be absorbed by the dark earth underneath or the water, and the process reverses. So at one level, you've got a planet that has the, these slight um, oscillations in its orbit that cause a regular oscillation between glacial and interglacial, and that is enough to trigger this reflectance mechanism, what's called albedo, the reflectance of light back into space, that causes that, which is really the driver of these glaciation events. So we have one layer at which we know this is true. And then there's a question about what other things might function in a way to radically alter the nature of the Earth. And there are some truly frightening possibilities on that list, including um, the possibility that fluctuations of what is internal to the Earth might cause a massive disruption in the orientation of the Earth in space, which can radically alter the facts of life on this planet.
that is far less certain, but let's just say when one looks at the evidence, very difficult to dismiss. That was beautifully explained how this gradual process of these forces can tip the world in one direction or another. When they align towards cold, it can get really, really cold. But it seems like we broke out of that ice age very, very rapidly. Have you seen those Greenland ice cores where they have a really dramatic, um, there's a really dramatic end to the Younger Dryas where the temperature just, you know, it's not gradual. It happens in like five, maybe 10 years where we just shoot out of the ice age. Yep, that is definitely not predicted by Milankovitch alone, that's for sure. The idea that I've I've gotten from Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson is that it, it was a meteor because there's this energy paradox. It's like, where did all this energy come from to create this rapid melting or the breakage of these dams? That had to come from somewhere because it's not a gradual thing, you know, these massive floods. And... Um, yeah, I think a meteor or something extraterrestrial hitting Earth could be a good explanation because those things hit Earth a lot more frequently than we think. Yes, I think the uh, there is some mechanism inside of academics and intellectuals that causes them to adhere too closely to the familiar, which makes remarkable things for which they have no direct perception seem not worth considering. And, you know, that is why I dearly love the story of J. Harlan Bretz. It, it allowed me to make this point to students in a way that it would have been difficult otherwise. And the fact that they could physically stand on the rim of that great waterfall, not even knowing what it was. I mean, that was part of the joy of this, was hiking them up to the rim of this waterfall and saying, do you know what you're looking at? You're looking at the largest waterfall that ever flowed on the face of the earth, and it's perfectly dry. How could that be? Right? That, you know, it, it's almost the perfect example of stepping outside of the realm of the purely social in order that the physical world can make its point. There's something about standing on the rim of that waterfall and realizing that you just hiked all the way up it and it didn't occur to you that that's what you were doing.